This is Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to Africa News Tonight from the English to Africa service of The Voice of America, your source for Pan-African news and world developments. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Coming up on Africa News Tonight, followers of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church have been killed in the country's Oromia region. The death toll from a powerful earthquake in Turkey has passed 11,000. And Nigeria has postponed Friday's deadline for trading in old banknotes for newly designed ones. We'll have these stories and more on African News Tonight. We start with our top story. The death toll in the devastating earthquake in Turkey and Syria continues to rise with nearly 12,000 known fatalities in the two countries. Aid is rushing to the victims, but it has been slow to arrive. Onur Erdogan is a reporter with VOA's Turkey, Turkey service. He is in the town of Iskenderun, which was hard hit. Iskenderun'dayım, Paç Meydanı'na yakın bir bölgedeyim. He, sa- he says in the past day, two people were rescued from a collapsed building near where he is standing, but he had just seen the bodies of two children pulled from the rubble. He says the rescue workers are not professionals. They are volunteers, residents of the area. He says there is no organized aid work or search and rescue work. Nigeria's Supreme Court has suspended the government's deadline to stop the use of old currency notes. The Central Bank of Nigeria has ordered people to swap out old bank notes for currency with a new design by the February 10th deadline. Reuters says Nigerians were due to turn in old 1,500 and 200 notes as part of a plan to curb cash in circulation and control inflation. The International Monetary Fund supports the deadline extension, saying a shortage of the new notes was disrupting trade and payments. Some have criticized the timing of the swap ahead of the February 25th elections as campaigns are funded by hard-to-trace cash. Three states are challenging the plan in court, arguing that it is causing hardship. U.S. State Department spokesman Samuel Warburg stressed that transparent management of oil revenues is currently the U.S. priority in Libya. He said this must include a mechanism for determining expenditures and steps to monitor them as well as accountability. Meanwhile, in a conversation with Prime Minister Abdul Hamid Dabiba, UN Special Representative to Libya Abdullahi Batili called for a fair distribution of oil revenues so all Libyans can benefit. Wolfgang Poshta, a former Austrian military attaché in Libya, explained to VOA senior analyst Mohamed al Shanawi why the U.S. and the U.N. are focusing on that issue. The struggle for the oil revenues is one of the key issues of the conflict. More than two-thirds of the hydrocarbon resources are located in Fesan and Syrenaika. But all these resources are managed by the National Oil Corporation, headquartered in Tripoli. Payments are made to the National Oil Corporation accounts at the Libyan Foreign Bank, the subsidiary of the Central Bank of Libya. And from there, the money is transferred to the Central Bank of Libya and CBL Governor Sadiq Al-Kabir uses this money to finance the government in Tripoli, regardless of any rival governments in other parts of the country. And most annoying for the Fesanis and Syrianitans, the vast majority of these revenues ends up in Tripolitania, mainly in the greater Tripoli and Misrata area. Just have a look and compare the city of Misrata, for example, with the city of Sepa. So understandably, the Fesanis and Syrianitans don't want to accept this any longer. The potential consequences are dire. This could range from a renewed oil blockade to an eventual establishment of a regional administration or government, which could lead the country into a new civil war. But the EU and the United States are fully aware of this. And this is the reason why they focus on this problem right now. I would say a formula for the distribution of the oil revenues enshrined in the Constitution and the transparent management 
of these oil revenues would do much to diffuse the conflict. But unfortunately, the leaders of the GNU, the leaders in Tripoli and Misrata, do not have a lot of interest in this. Last week, the Italian Prime Minister signed an $8 billion gas deal with Libyan Prime Minister De Beba, which his own oil minister, Mohamed Aoun, rejected. De Beba said delaying Italian company in his gas deal would turn Libya into a gas importer by 2027. The Libyan Audit Bureau discussed the Eni gas deal with oil minister Aoun and promised to review the deal. What's your take on that? Minister of Oil Mohamed Aoun has questioned the legality of the Eni NOC gas contract, which includes an increase of the Italian share of the gas production from 30% to 37%. According to Aoun, this should have been approved in advance by the Ministry of Oil, means by him, and thereafter by the Council of Ministers. The Beba, in a response to the ongoing criticism, not only from Aoun, but also from others, stressed that the contract came about after long and thorough negotiations, and it serves first and foremost Libyan interests. He is probably right with his statement that without this deal, Libya would need to import gas in a few years, as there is an increasing need for investments into the gas industry, even to maintain the current level of production. Furthermore, the demand is also increasing as new power plants go online to satisfy the tremendous energy demands of the Libyans. Last summer, there were plenty of blackouts. This should be avoided this year and in the next years to come. So altogether, the any knock gas deal is a win-win for both sides. On one side, Italy is able to replace part of the Russian gas deliveries, And on the other side, Libya gets the desperately needed investment into its own gas industry. And Prime Minister Dabeba got his international recognition as a prime minister. And he was able to prove himself as a successful business leader. That was Wolfgang Postai, former Austrian military attaché in Libya, speaking with VOA's Mohamed El Shanawi. Speaking in front of a divided Congress for the first time since he took office, President Joe Biden delivered his second State of the Union address Tuesday evening, touting low unemployment numbers and the end of pandemic emergency as he pleads for bipartisanship that's even more elusive under a Republican-controlled House of Representatives. VOA's White House Bureau Chief Patsy Wida Kuswara has this report. Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. During his second State of the Union speech on Tuesday, his third address to a joint session of Congress since taking office, President Joe Biden stayed with his unity agenda. Speaker, I don't want to ruin your reputation, but I look forward to working with you. (laughs) Biden touted increased American manufacturing and legislation that invests in renewable energy production, domestic semiconductor industry, and infrastructure to compete against China. We used to be number one in the world in infrastructure. We've sunk to 13th in the world. The United States of America, 13th in the world in infrastructure, modern infrastructure. But now we're coming back because we came together and passed the bipartisan infrastructure law. Addressing high inflation, Biden argued the problem is global, caused by the pandemic and the war on Ukraine, and focused instead on low unemployment. We've created, with the help of many people in this room, 12 million new jobs, more jobs created in two years than any president's created in four years. He highlighted steps his administration took to erase federal student loan debt, increase the number of insured Americans, implement COVID relief programs, and lower prescription drug prices. But can he convince Americans things are looking up? Republicans are determined to stop him, with Sarah Huckabee Sanders, Arkansas governor and former White House press secretary under President Donald Trump, delivering the GOP response. In the radical left's America, Washington taxes you and lights your hard-earned money on fire. But you get crushed with high gas prices, empty grocery shelves, and our children are taught to hate one another on account of their race, but not to love one another or our great country. With Republicans controlling the House of Representatives following the November election, new House Speaker Kevin McCarthy has promised renewed scrutiny on the administration, including on the classified documents found in Biden's home, the billions of dollars of aid to Ukraine, and what they say is his weak response to a Chinese surveillance balloon, which the U.S. recently shot down. Despite low unemployment and gas prices down sharply from a record high in mid-2022, 
Biden's approval ratings remain at 40 percent. While his speech is unlikely to change that, it does signal that he is likely to run again in 2024. Jennifer Marcicha teaches presidential rhetoric at Texas A&M University. He didn't say if he is or he isn't, but he made the case for why he should, right, which is that he can see what needs to be done. He's had all of these successes so far. He's had all of this achievement, but there's still a lot more that he wants to get done. As a gesture of solidarity to Ukraine, First Lady Jill Biden again invited the country's ambassador, Oksana Markarova. And parents of Tyree Nichols, the black man who was beaten by Tennessee police officers and died days later. When police officers or police departments violate the public trust, they must be held accountable. Following recent shootings in California, Biden again called on Congress to ban assault-style rifles. He urged Republicans to come up with immigration reform, debt reduction proposals, and vowed to protect reproductive rights. Make no mistake about it. If Congress passes a national ban, I will veto it. And the but bipartisan legislation is unlikely under a divided government. In a few months, Biden is set to clash with Republicans who are demanding spending cuts before agreeing to pass a debt ceiling hike to prevent the country from defaulting. Patsy Wiedenkuswara, VOA News, Washington. The U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit was just two months ago, so many thought President Joe Biden would use his State of the Union address to follow up on the commitments made then. He might support the growth and protection of democracy on the continent and call for African nations to join the U.S. in suppressing insurgents and Islamic extremists. William Lawrence, professor of international relations at the American University in Washington, explained to VOA senior analyst Mohammed El Shanawi why the president did not touch on that aspect in his address. This is because the way this administration has approached foreign policy from the beginning. But let me first say that part two of the Democracy Summit is happening within the next two months. And it is a high foreign policy party for the administration, even though it wasn't in the speech. But there was a reconfiguration of U.S. foreign policy to make a foreign policy that made sense to the American working class and middle class and prioritized their issues. This administration has clearly decided I did not to talk about foreign policy that much to U.S. domestic audiences. The only two foreign policy he spent any time on were Ukraine and China, and that was sort of a signaling to the world of what the U.S. cares about in foreign policy with a focus on democracy, you know, as a general theme. And he had this statement, which I didn't quite agree with during the speech, that democracies were up and autocracies down when the NGOs are telling us there is some democratic backsliding going on. So that wasn't directly correct. But he didn't want to get into things like terrorism and insurgencies and extremism, because that's just not a priority anymore for Americans. Including this type of thing in a foreign policy speech will happen, but the speech was only about 5% foreign policy because that's what Americans care about. This is Joe Biden, working class guy from Scranton, Pennsylvania, representative of working class Americans, letting them know that their domestic material well-being matters. And that's why at the opening of the speech, he did talk about the global food crisis in inflation and the price of energy, because that's what the average American talks about. He wasn't talking to the world. He was talking to he Americans. He wants to vote for him in two years. President Biden reiterated his campaign pledge and said, our nation is working for more freedom, more dignity, and more peace, not just in Europe, but everywhere. Would that mean a doctrine for what is left of his presidency in all parts of the world, especially with a spate of military coups in Africa? That remains to be seen. This administration has made clear statements of principle and has followed through on those principles in some and not in many others. This raises the question of Palestine. This raises the question of Hong Kong, Taiwan, and the Uyghurs vis-a-vis -vis China. It applies to Western Sahara. It applies to forgotten wars like the Congo and frozen conflicts like Libya or Somalia in its own way and, and elsewhere. And the coups you mentioned, you know, populations across the world who live in relatively democratic free societies is about a hundred. That leaves about 90 countries that don't. And 
the statement of principles implies a principled foreign policy. So the question is, what will we do about the conflict zones and those 90 countries that are unfree? Hopefully the U.S. will do more. I'm not holding my breath. But one thing the U.S. can do is lead on the systems like human rights reporting, which the U.S. has led the world in, reporting on trafficking, reporting on corruption and terrorist financing. So even when the U.S. isn't necessarily intervening to help this country or population or that country or population, it can sort of lead the world in setting standards. But to directly answer your question, the U.S. will pay lip service on some issues, make small efforts on others, medium efforts on others, and big efforts on others. And let me just say that the U.S. generally is the world's security leader damned if they do and damned if they don't. When the U.S. intervenes, they're being post-imperialistic and meddling. And when they don't intervene, they don't care about these populations and, and they don't have principles. And so the U.S. has to make strategic choices that works for itself, not just for its principles. People are threatened by terrorism. People are threatened by state terrorism. People are threatened by autocracy, by corruption. But what the U.S. can do is do what it can, where it can, when it can, with the resources it's had, has, and then help build this global institutional order and deal with systems level change at the global order. And in the end, hopefully the U.S. is just more a force for good than for bad and for making things better and not worse. And if I could just conclude, the U.S. spends billions of dollars educating and empowering populations around the world. And perhaps that empowerment helps the next generation a lot, too. And that's a big part of this question as well. That was William Lawrence, professor of international relations at the American University in Washington, speaking with VOA senior analyst Mohammed El Shanawi. VOA Africa is your trusted source for news, sports, entertainment, and music. Stay engaged with VOA Africa. We love to hear your voice. You can call us 24-7 on WhatsApp and leave a message. Leave comments, requests, or greetings. We may play your message on VOA Africa. Dial the international code PLUS1. Then 202-258-3076. VOA Africa is always happy to hear your voice. The number again is the international code plus one. Then 202-258-3076. Uganda says it will not renew the mandate of the UN's Human Rights Office. Reuters reports that the Foreign Affairs Ministry says the country has developed its own ability to monitor rights, saying in a letter there is peace in the country, coupled with strong national human rights institutions and a vibrant civil society. The Uganda branch of the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights was established in 2006 to focus on alleged violations in the country's conflict-plagued north and northeast, but was later extended to the whole country. Over the years, human rights groups have accused President Yaware Museveni's government of various abuses, including torture, illegal detentions, and extrajudicial killings of opponents. Authorities deny the charges and say any security forces found guilty of abuse have been punished. Followers of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church have been killed over the last several days by security forces in the Oromia region. There is anxiety about the future of one of the world's oldest churches because of a breakaway group. The church has accused the government of being sympathetic to the breakaway fraction. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church, as well as the breakaway group, have called for separate rallies Sunday in the capital of Ethiopia, Addis Ababa. I reached out to William Davison, senior analyst for Ethiopia for the crisis group, to brief us on the matter. The um, the, the current problems related to the Orthodox Church, they stem from a dispute uh, partly over language issues, and it has led to a breakaway element um, from within Oromia um, who have objected to the refusal to be able to deliver services in the local language. And this sort of attempt to set up a sort of autonomous part of the church was resisted uh, by the Holy 
synod, which you know, excommunicated um, some of the clergy involved. But those clergy, and it seems you know, with the backing to some degree, and, and I think this is disputed, elements of the Oromo Oromia authorities um, have sort of proceeded with their efforts to establish or create more autonomy for themselves in Oromia. And it's during that process that there has been you know, the violence um, and deaths in, in Shashimeni, um allegations that that was Oromia security forces firing on worshippers. But you know, with a lack of independent reporting, it's been hard to establish those those facts. So this your know, breakaway element has, has obviously been resisted by the church's central authorities. Uh, many people associated with the church seem to believe that not just the government in Oromia, but also the prime minister and his federal government showing some form of sympathy or support for the breakaway faction, which is increasing the political tension around this issue. Um, and there are demonstrations uh, scheduled um, on the, the 12th of February by, by both of these um, parts of the, of the church. Uh, so let's talk about uh, uh, the Prime Minister. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church has accused the government of meddling in its internal affairs after the Prime Minister instructed his cabinet ministers to keep out of the matter, saying the church should solve the problem through its internal mechanisms. Yes, well, I, I think that um, clearly uh, this is about um, these various claims of, of legitimacy within the church. And equally, obviously, the Holy Synod has a very strong claim to legitimacy. And yes, they want the government support for their position. And so our understanding is that you know, the prime minister, by refusing to explicitly intervene and show support for the Holy Synod, um, that has angered people, as it's seen as tacit support for this breakaway faction. Elements are trying to achieve more, more autonomy within Oromia. So that's, you know, that seems to be at the, at, at the root of why the, the Prime Minister's stance has, has caused anger amongst the segments of the Orthodox community. The Ethiopian government got through a civil war and came to a peace deal with uh, the, the North in Tigray. And now it's being immersed into this uh, whole thing with the church. Clearly, this is a, an example of a very worrying and, 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 and damaging um, political turmoil. And I think the question, can the um, Orthodox Church itself you find you know, some consensus and, and accommodation between the different positions and achieve reconciliation? The critical thing here is that this problem within the church does not worsen or infect the broader political conversation and, and worsen tension. And it is probably also another indication and that to achieve uh, the type of political stability that the country so so clearly needs, then you know, all of these conversations and all of this multitude of, of political actors and, and from throughout society um, do need to come together and start trying to address the root um, of these disagreements. And, and try and chart a common path forward. William Davison, senior analyst for Ethiopia for the Crisis Group, he talked to me from Nairobi. A Kenyan man pleaded not guilty today to the slaying of a prominent LGBTQ activist last month. Freelance photographer Jack Ton Odihambo, the partner of Edwin Chiloba, denied killing the activist whose body was found dumped in a metal box along a roadside. The French news agency AFP reported an autopsy found he has been smothered with a piece of denim covering his mouth and nose and socks stuffed into his mouth. Odihambo will remain in custody until a bail hearing on February 16th. Chiloba was targeted by online abuse even after his death, prompting human rights campaigners to call for protection of the LGBTQ community. And in Egypt, the counter-terrorism court has sentenced one man to death and 11 to life in prison for joining a terrorist group linked to the Islamic State. The French news agency AFP says the court also issued three 15-year jail sentences, three 10-year sentences, and four acquittals. 
The state media says the defendants were found guilty of leading or joining a terrorist group between 2015 and September 7, 2019. The sentences are part of a crackdown that began 10 years ago when Army Chief and current President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi took power and cracked down on Islamic extremists. AFP notes that in January, Egyptian courts sentenced 85 people to death with nearly half approved by the Grand Mufti. Amnesty International says Egypt carried out the third highest number of executions in the world in 2021 following China and Iran. And with that, we wrap up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yehei Suhib in Washington. On behalf of our producer,